Today I'm uh, <laughs> pleased to introduce Dan uh, Stamper Kern from Berkeley. And uh, Dan, uh, uh, those, those of us in the coal mining community know him quite well. He did his graduate work after graduating from Berkeley. He went to MIT and was uh, Wolfgang Ketterle's right hand man in the early days of BEC, uh, in those first results in the mid 90s. Um, and uh, got his PhD in 2000. No, 1998? 2000. 2000, all right. <laughs> and uh, he went to Caltech as a Millikan postdoc fellow uh, working with Jeff Kimball and then went up the coast to Berkeley and took a faculty position. I thought that was 2000, maybe 2002. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was everything was okay. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a quick postdoc at Caltech. Well, at Berkeley, uh, Dan sort of uh, started a cool down group uh, there. Uh, really, the, the, it was the first cold out uh, effort, uh, 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 you know, main effort at Berkeley, and he's he's done some uh, amazing work dealing with uh, especially uh, magnetic interactions between cold atoms. Uh, these 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 sp so-called spinner condensates. The magnetic interactions can play a very important role when you go over a phase transition. Uh, the formation of these um, of these domains and textures, as he would call them, uh, was was a, a, a very interesting result, and uh, in fact, that that led him my way to a certain extent. In, the, in 2005 or so, he convinced me that ion traps were pretty good for uh, studying magnetism, and uh, I must say I wasn't really uh, on board with that. But he convinced me. We went after this DARPA OLA program in 2006. That he's part of this consortium that funds a lot of your work <laughs> in this audience. Um, but his work is uh, 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 far-reaching over many areas in cold atom. Uh, cold atomic physics from, from these uh, uh, cold uh, uh, spinner condensates also to uh, cavity optomechanics, and we'll hear a little bit about that today. But uh, the, the spinner condensate work seems to have evolved over to more optical lattice work. I don't think he's going to talk about it today, but he's, he's building very exotic optical lattices that will allow uh, further studies of magnetic frustration, even in, in, in two dimensions, building Kagame lattices and so forth. Um, but today he will uh, uh, tell us about his work using uh, optomechanics uh, realized in a sample of atoms themselves as the uh, movable element and uh, bridging uh, quantum mechanics from the micro scale individual atoms to a, 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 what you might call a big scale and that is having millions or billions of atoms being the mechanical oscillator. So uh, Dan, will you, he'll spend his day here uh, and as is typical he'll go to NIST uh, tomorrow in Gettysburg. Thanks, Dan. Nice tea. Pardon me? Tea. Oh, excuse me. We always have a tea, uh, Dan, and another at 4 o'clock for the, for the speaker to visit with students and postdocs exclusively. I'll get the lights. And, and uh, uh, so that will happen at the usual place in the CSS building, the conference building, at 4 o'clock. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. I guess uh, lunch was uh, superlative today, so here you all are. Um, yeah, and here I am again giving the talk uh, right after lunch. I believe it's only a 60% incentive because the other 40% don't show up. Yeah, okay. well, you know, it seems very effective. But anyway, yeah, thanks for having, uh, having me out. I'll tell you about um, a certain aspect of the work I've been doing with my group uh, in Berkeley, which is... Um, Honestly, something that we just uh, stumbled into, and uh, we had uh, set up experiments uh, placing atoms inside of optical cavities for other purposes. And uh, like many of my uh, ideas, the initial direction of our research didn't work out at all. And uh, we were trying a certain range of experiments having to do with measurement and spin squeezing and such, uh, and, uh, and failed at that, but saw other weird things coming out of the uh, experiment. And by the time we had uh, come to understand what was going on, and I had remembered some of the things I had learned from other people along the way, uh, we, re we realized that we were doing uh, cavity optomechanics in our laboratory at a rather fortuitous time when uh, very many groups around the world were concentrating their experimental efforts in this direction. Um, the motivation for um, uh, the intense recent work in uh, optomechanics actually stems from uh, theoretical musings that uh, took place several decades ago as physicists considered whether it was possible to detect gravity waves directly on Earth. So here's the one slide connection to gravity waves uh, for the rest of my talk. Okay, so gravity waves apparently uh, occur that as you, uh, just as you, when you accelerate charges, they emit electromagnetic radiation. 
Similarly, when you accelerate masses, they emit gravitational radiation. And uh, there is a hope, especially if very massive objects are accelerating about each other. Typically, these are you know, pairs of black holes that are about to merge into one. Then rather intense gravity waves might be emitted in our direction. And they come pass through us. And they don't uh, move things in our vicinity by very much. A gravity wave is a, a modulation in the strain. So it's a modulation in the relative distance between objects that is proportional to the separation between those objects. So to get a sizable displacement of two objects, you have to place them at a fair distance from one another. So that's what this laboratory uh, was constructed to do, ultimately. And uh, inside of this building, and connected by a long vacuum tube, there's another building over there. In those two locations, there are two suspended mirrors. And uh, at LIGO, one is trying to measure the separation between these two mirrors and detect a strain from a particularly strong gravity wave signal on the order of 10 to the minus 23. That's about how strong we can expect it to be on Earth. It's quite a, a ludicrous thing to try to measure. Uh, the displacement of one of these mirrors with respect to the other is just 10 to the minus 20 meters. And yet people believe they can measure it, and indeed they're achieving the sensitivity these days that should permit uh, the direct observation of gravity waves uh, when the detectors turn back on. And uh, the way they proposed to detect this was to detect it optically. They're going to measure the separation between these two mirrors with respect to uh, wavelengths of light. And they're going to, uh, they use uh, quite a lot of light that bounces back and forth these mirrors to pick up uh, detection sensitivity. So uh, in, in trying to justify the LIGO detectors before they were constructed, some theory work had to be done to understand whether the detection sensitivities could be reached uh, to see gravity waves. And um, in, in the process of constructing that theory, people started understanding, I guess, somewhat better what are the... Uh, what are the implications of quantum mechanics for ultimately for the measure for the sensitivity of these devices? And uh, really a, a beautiful set of uh, theory was constructed on uh, the interrelation between measurement and back action and uh, how to harness that interrelationship in a useful way and also realizing that the LIGO detector itself was going to operate as a very large uh, hybrid quantum system where mechanical objects become uh, closely connected in their quantum properties uh, to the quantum optical properties of a single mode light field. Okay, so that body of work was interesting enough that people then wanted to test these uh, theoretical, theoretical ideas experimentally in a setting that was a little more amenable to experimentation. And so they've developed a wide range of cavity optomechanical systems. So everything from, uh, I guess, meter scale simulations of LIGO all the way down to very uh, miniaturized objects um, uh, oscillators ranging from uh, massive grand scale mechanical oscillators to things down in the pico or femtogram scale and then a wide range of electromagnetic resonators as well. And so when one goes to a meeting these days in cavity optomechanics one has to become very quickly uh, versed in uh, a whole range of experimental techniques that are applying but, but fortunately we're all using similar language at this point at least to describe fairly similar goals. And the similar goals that are discussed are reaching settings where the quantum fluctuations of, uh, due to the fact that uh, a mechanical system is interacting with light, uh, the effect of the quantum fluctuations of light on the mechanics should be dominant over thermal fluctuations on the mechanics. Um, and so that's something that's being reached in several laboratories these days. Once one is at that regime, one wants to uh, understand the quantum level effects that take place in the system. And then finally, perhaps to harness it for some studies even in uh, basic science, so as understanding whether uh, entanglement and notions of quantum mechanics apply to macroscopic objects as well as to uh, light ones. Where my longer term perspective, uh, my longer term perspective on this field is that uh, cavity optomechanics will evolve in, in the direction of uh, greater complexity. And I think we are already in a position where we've uh, completely tamed single mechanical oscillators interacting with an optical field. So um, at least in my laboratory, the consideration has been, well, what's, what's next? And we're considering uh, placing more complicated quantum systems in contact with optical fields. OK. So here's uh, one way in which cavity optomechanics is set up. Like in the LIGO detector, you can imagine that there's one mirror of an optical cavity which is mechanically compliant and it oscillates with some particular resonance frequency. 
So if the system is constructive uh, well, then it might be described by a simple Hamiltonian, which has the energy of the mechanics uh, of the electromagnetic field inside the mm -hmm. cavity, the interaction of all of this with the outside world, both the mechanical and the optical inputs. And then finally, this would be the optomechanical interaction. Pretty innocent looking term. And let's parse it in a couple of different ways to understand its implications. On one hand, the term expresses that the energy of a photon in the cavity changes linearly with the displacement of the mechanical element. So if I take displacement, I multiply it by a force that gives me an energy. And so this force here quantifies uh, how sensitive an optical measurement can become to mechanical motion. Okay, so the larger is this force, this quantity in this term, uh, the greater is, let's say, the cavity resonance frequency shift uh, per whatever nanometer displacement of the oscillator. Now, of course, every measurement has a back action, and the back action of measurement is of a position measurement, which is what's being proposed here, is to perturb the momentum of the object. And that comes about from the same uh, term as well. If I just uh, group the terms differently, I see that the mechanical system is subject to a force, and the force is proportional to the number of photons in the cavity. F is now the per photon force. When I make a measurement with light, where, for example, at the end I'm going to measure the phase of an optical field uh, in order to measure the cavity resonance frequency, I necessarily have an uncertainty in the number of photons that I'm using for that measurement. That means that there's an uncertain force on the object during the history of measurement, and that's what gives the necessary back action. And so it won't surprise you that with a couple of lines of uh, algebra scribbled on the board in my uh, quantum mechanics courses, uh, we can see easily how the uh, certainty that you gain by measurement is matched by the uncertainty that's imposed on the momentum of the oscillator. So, as often is the case, when uh, limiting the electromagnetic field to a single mode inside of a cavity, one gets a clear picture of how measurement and back action are, are closely related. Okay. So how is this thing actually realized experimentally? There's many realizations of cavity optomechanics these days. The, one that is most relevant to my uh, experiments, at least the solid-state analog of it, of them, is uh, work that uh, Jack Harris got going at Yale, where he made this really lovely observation, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard of this already, but he found that uh, cover slips that you place on electron uh, microscopes also happen to serve as excellent optical and excellent mechanical elements, so that for maybe 50 bucks, you can buy uh, a very thin membrane of silicate nitride. It turns out to have uh, to, to ring mechanically for seconds or sometimes even minutes. And you can place this very thin dielectric inside of a high finesse optical resonator. And as you translate this dielectric along through the cavity, you find that at locations where the dielectric is in the node of the electric field, it shifts the cavity resonance only by a slight bit. And if you place it in the antinode of the field, it, sw it changes the cavity resonance frequency by a large amount. That's uh, shown here on the right. And so clearly, if I place my, my membrane at a location such as indicated here, then the cavity frequency varies linearly with the displacement of that membrane. So there you go. There's uh, cavity optomechanics. We turned out, we turned out that we had adopted a similar approach. And we had replaced his uh, membrane of silicon nitride with a membrane of rubidium atoms. And we take a, a gas of thousands of rubidium atoms, and we trap them very tightly at a fixed location inside of the cavity. Uh, each atom uh, causes a little bit of a, a frequency shift of the cavity. Each atom is polarizable, so it has, if you will, a bit of an index of refraction, and that shifts the uh, phase of the electric field as it passes through the atom. Okay, so altogether, the frequency shift that we get per atom in the cavity is something that's controlled by this quantity. It depends on how far detuned from the atomic resonance uh, is the light that's probing the atoms. And it de depends also on the position of the atom within the resonator, whether the atom is in the dark or in the brightest part of the beam, of the, of the probe beam. Okay, so we have many such atoms. The cavity is sensitive simultaneously to the motion of all of them. Well, how complicated is that? And um, the first experiments and the first theoretical works dealing with um, uh, mechanical effects of, on atoms inside of resonators, uh, when they approached the problem of uh, dealing with more than one atom, um, they, they were really depressing. They, they, it looked like a, an extremely complicated problem with you know, all sorts of wild motion of two particles as they 
uh, with, with forces between them and friction on this one due to that one and all sorts of nasty stuff. But it turns out that in the limits where we were working, the uh, system turns uh, again to something remarkably simple. And the simplifying principle in our case, as is often the case in atomic physics, is that the atoms are displaced from their equilibrium position only by a very small amount. A small amount compared to the wavelength of light. And that means that if you look at the overall uh, shift in the cavity resonance frequency, and you just expand it to small order in the displacements of atoms from their equilibrium positions, you get something uh, linear, of course. And so there's a shift in the cavity resonance frequency, which is proportional to some weighted sum of the displacements of all the atoms, weighted by how sensitive the cavity is to the motion of these atoms. And if I take this weighted sum, and I just say, hey, let me define a new collective mode variable, to describe motion in my collection of atoms, um, then this one collective variable is what the cavity senses. In its uh, simplest realization, let's just imagine that all the atoms are, are tightly trapped at a single location inside the cavity. One finds fairly simply that the cavity is sensitive to the center of mass displacement of that gas of atoms. So here I have, I have a gas of atoms. They're all very tightly bound in this uh, direction along the cavity axis. They're all moving fairly independently. So I can choose you know, normal modes uh, pretty much at will. And I can choose one of the normal mode variables to be the center of mass variable. And the other modes, which have to do with atoms uh, moving out of phase with one another, those are modes of motion that exist in the gas, but which I don't sense using the cavity probe light. Okay, so that's uh, pictured here. In fact, what happens in my system is that you know, the trap that holds the atoms is not perfectly harmonic. The atoms collide with each other. So these, there is, you know, these aren't perfectly well-respected uh, normal modes. Uh, but nevertheless, one picture for what's going on is that the center of mass mode is, is a fairly well-defined mode of my gas. It has a limited quality factor due to its interaction with all these other modes. These other modes are not what I observe, but they do impact the mechanical degree of freedom that I do observe by, let's say, providing it with a, some damping. So I have a damp mechanical oscillator, which is the motion of these atoms, uh, inside the cavity, and it's connected to a bath, a thermal bath, which is at the temperature of all of these modes, which is the temperature to which I brought the atoms by evaporative cooling. Okay, so this is actually realized in this uh, apparatus. We, uh, for other reasons, we decided to use an atom chip for these experiments. You guys have heard of atom chips here as well. You use microfabrication to lay down electromagnets that you use to generate the magnetic fields that orchestrate an atomic physics experiment. So it's a way of taking a complex experiment and to some degree integrating and, and miniaturizing it. So here's uh, a through picture of a silicon atom chip where atoms would be trapped from a vapor in this location, uh, transported along down the chip to these locations, and then at these locations uh, we've dug a little hole through the chip which allows light to pass vertically through the chip and that light now uh, resonates between two high-quality curved mirrors. So there's our uh, optical cavity. And at this point, the atom chip serves only to deliver a gas of atoms every 20 seconds or so uh, into the resonator. Okay, so the, the atom chip pr pr provides a, a magnetic trap for these cold atoms. The atoms are not condensed. The atoms are rubidium <coughs> atoms. Um, they're very tightly trapped in two dimensions. They're kind of loosely trapped along the third and the cavity uh, uh, is oriented in this direction. Okay, so using uh, parameters of the magnetic trap generated by the atom chip, we can place the atoms at particular vertical positions within the cavity. Okay. At that point, we turn off the magnetic trap and we switch on an optical trap. So the optical trap is formed with light that is resonant with the cavity, but very far off resonant from the atoms. So we'll ignore any optomechanics related to that uh, off resonant light. It simply provides a uh, lattice potential, and the atoms rush into the nearest lattice site and remain trapped there now with the magnetic fields turned off. Then we come along and we probe the atomic motion with uh, another mo mode of light, which is also resonant with the cavity, but is now fairly close to the atomic transition. Let's say between 5 and 100 gigahertz detuned from the atomic transition. Okay. And uh, you notice that the wavelength of light that I use to trap my atoms is different from the one that I use to probe my atoms, which is uh, potentially a drag, but it also actually turns out to be a feature in these experiments because of the following. So 
let's say I place my atoms in this well right here, right? And then I've placed my atoms at a location where the probe intensity, the nearer, nearer to resonance probe intensity, uh, has a sharp gradient at the location where the atoms are trapped. So that's a location of maximal linear, linear sensitivity to their motion, similar to the experiments which uh, Jack Harris was doing at Yale. Alternately, we can place our atoms at locations where the electric field of the probe either has a node or an antinode, and then we would have quadratic sensitivity to the displacement of the atoms, so we'd be able to explore a different type of optomechanical interaction instead. These data show you that we have this sort of, uh, this fine level of control over where the atoms are positioned inside of the cavity. I can place the atoms at locations where they don't shift the uh, cavity resonance frequency by much. That's where the atoms are located essentially in the nodes of the electric field of the probe. Or I can place the atoms where they have the maximal effect on the cavity resonance frequency and on places in between. And you'll see the fact that I've used two colors, one to trap and one to probe the atom, the atoms, has allowed me to be very sloppy about where I position my atoms originally. All I have to do is specify their location within about five microns, uh, but I get sub-wavelength control of their position within the probe field using this uh, super lattice approach. Now you'll notice that uh, where, when I've tried to place my atoms in the dark spot in the cavity at the node of the electric field of the probe, uh, I still see the, the presence of the atoms inside of the resonator. So why is that? Uh, well, one is the fact that I'm, you know, I'm trapping uh, atoms that have a finite, uh, you know, uh, they, there's a zero point uh, width to the wave function, so I can only trap them so tightly given the uh, uh, trapping freak, uh, potential that I've provided. So even with the atoms centered at the node of the electric field, they do spill over to locations where there is some probe light and they're able to shift the cavity field. That doesn't quite explain, I suppose, the contrast that you see in these pictures. Rather, uh, what the data we have here, we're suggesting that atoms are not trapped within a single well of our optical lattice trap, but within a few neighboring wells. So we would have guessed that the atoms are distributed in three neighboring wells. And later, when we took a picture of the atomic distribution, we indeed saw that the atoms are in three neighboring wells. So that was a pretty good uh, uh, guess. Uh, nevertheless, at locations like this, you see that uh, while the atoms uh, experience somewhat different uh, linear optomechanical coupling, so long as their center of masses all resonate at the same frequency, I might just consider the overall center of mass of this gas uh, to be the relevant, or a weighted center of mass to be the relevant uh, collective mode that the cavity senses. I'll return to that point later. Okay, so now let me uh, take you through some of the phenomenology of cavity optomechanics as it works out in our experiments. First, I've uh, promoted the idea that we can use a cavity to measure the motion of a mechanical element. So let me show you how that's done. Uh, a mechanical element, as it moves, changes the, uh, the the frequency difference between a probe field and the cavity resonance. And uh, the electric field inside of a cavity, given that you're probing it at a fixed frequency, has this uh, form. And I can ask myself, uh, if, if I have a mechanical element that moves slightly and slightly changes the detuning between my probe and my cavity, where would I be most sensitive, where would I be able to collect the most information per photon on the position of this mechanical element? Okay, so a little bit, a quick bit of math shows me that the most sensitive uh, condition for probing would be to probe the cavity right on its resonance, at which point if I detect the phase of the field inside of the cavity, I have high sensitivity to motion. Alternately, I can probe the cavity off resonance, and as the mechanical element moves back and forth, now you'll see also that the intensity of light reflected or transmitted from the cavity uh, will vary with the position of the element. So let me just uh, show you data that where we sense the intensity of light transmitted through the cavity. So we start our experiment. We stuff some somewhat unknown number of atoms inside of the cavity. Uh, we turn on the probe at a, at a frequency far from resonance, but then using some feedback, we bring the probe to where it's sitting right on the side of the cavity resonance line. So now as the atoms are jiggling back and forth in the cavity, their motion should be recorded in the number of uh, photons, let's say, per second that come out of the resonator. As we continue our experiments, the atoms heat up, they evaporate out of the trap, the number of atoms diminishes, but our feedback uh, takes account of that, so we get a long record of, uh, of what's happening with the atoms inside the resonator. 
And you see that the early parts of the data record are fuzzier than the later parts. And that's because they contain information. They contain the information on the motion of my, of my atomic ensemble. So here you see if I take slices of the data and before Fourier transforms, I see my mechanical system oscillating in this case at about 30 kilohertz. In a, diagrammatic, in a diagrammatic manner, what I've shown you is the following. Uh, let's say I want to sense the mechanical state of my, of my system. Okay? The way I'm going to do so is uh, use the fact that mechanical displacements translate into modulations of the cavity field. So this line here represents the cavity field. And I can detect it, let's say, by looking at either amplitude or phase modulations uh, at the output. Now, uh, depending on experimental conditions, I can ask myself how do uh, changes in the position and momentum of the mechanical oscillator impact the, the field inside of the cavity and those uh, relations would be given by, uh, by various matrices that relate uh, in the sense inputs which may be uh, position momentum of the mechanical system to outputs which would be the uh, modulations of the cavity field. The same diagram already tells me what I have to do in order to measure forces in my system. Okay, so by the same token, I can imagine what I want to measure is not the mechanical state per se, but I want to measure forces, which may be gravity waves or whatever other uh, weak perturbation might be uh, applied to my mechanical system. Uh, so those forces translate into changes in the position and momentum of the mechanical system, according to how close they are to mechanical resonances, say. And then that uh, translates through a pair of matrices into, uh, into the output which I sense uh, optically. Uh, you know, one of the main motivations for cavity optic mechanics is force detection. I'll get back to that later. Okay, so we're measuring a mechanical system. And uh, we expect the fact that we're measuring the object to influence the object. So here's a few ways in which that influence is sensed, the back action of the measurement. There are uh, coherent and incoherent back action effects. The coherent ones are um, ones that you can you know, describe without ascribing any noise to the optical field. Uh, one of those is a phenomenon known as the optical spring. And it's fairly simple to understand how this comes about. Uh, the mechanical system feels a force proportional to the photon number in the cavity. As the mechanical system moves, it changes the cavity resonance frequency, which then changes the number of photons in the cavity. So you can imagine that this can result in, a, in an effective spring, where as the mechanical system moves around, it li linearly modulates the optical force that it feels. And uh, the optical spring constant can be easily derived as a function of uh, where you're probing your system with respect to the cavity resonance. Um, so, we were curious, we went ahead and measured this frequency shift and it had the correct uh, variation with detuning. Uh, we weren't the first to observe this, uh, optical this optical spring effect, but what I loved about this, uh, the, these data was that it showed that we were on the right track, that we could really make a quantitative prediction on what was potentially a very complicated system, thousands of atoms jiggling around inside of a cavity, using just the very simple theories of cavity optic mechanics that I showed you on the previous slide. So we, we had grabbed onto the right simplification and we could expect it to perform uh, to, to be quantitatively correct. Another effect related to the optical spring is uh, cavity cooling. So uh, here the thought is that the number of photons inside of the cavity is uh, not related to the position of the oscillator right now but related to the position of the mechanical element a little while earlier. Because the cavity has a finite line width, it takes a, it takes a while for the, the change in the cavity frequency to, be, to have an impact on the number of photons inside of the cavity. So given that delay, one finds that uh, you can treat the optical spring as having a bit of an imaginary component. And, uh, and that, uh, that's uh, given by this quantity over here. And depending on how you are uh, with your probe detuned with respect to the cavity resonance, this can represent either a damping of the mechanical motion or indeed an amplification of the mechanical motion. Uh, that's also been measured with uh, cold atom systems. This is an experiment that was performed uh, at MIT. Um, we, we couldn't think of how to measure the, uh, the, um, the cavity cooling effect. Indeed, we thought it was a little bit silly to do so because the uh, temperature limits that are reached by cavity cooling are the temperature limits set by the line width of the cavity. Just like in Doppler cooling, 
one expected that the, the temperature limit would be limited by the Doppler width of the, of the atoms. Uh, in our case, the, temperatures of, the temperature of the gas reached just by evaporative cooling was so much lower than that uh, cavity cooling limit that the only effect of cavity cooling in our experiment would be to raise the temperature of the atoms. All we would see would be the diffusive heating and none of the damping. Uh, but these guys managed to do it. They basically amplify the motion of the mechanical system like crazy, and then they uh, turn around and they cool it back down, and they're able to see the cooling force having the right uh, dependence. Again, a quantitative match with theory. So to add a few more links in this diagram, what we now see is that the mechanical element moves. It changes the cavity field, but the cavity field then exerts forces back on the mechanical element. And that this sort of closed feedback loop uh, impacts the, uh, the mechanics uh, of the system. Now, there's also the incoherent back action effects, which are the ones that are related to measurement back action. And those, again, as I described, those are due to the fact that the number of photons inside of the cavity, being an operator, has quantum fluctuations. So there's a fluctuating force on the atom and that on the mechanical element, and that then leads to uh, diffusive heating. And this is apparently a great revelation to the uh, LIGO community when uh, Carlton Caves pointed out that it was uh, an important fact. Apparently they had been debates about whether quantum mechanics will ever have anything to do with, uh, with limitations of a LIGO detector should it ever be built. So Carlton Caves, maybe you know him, maybe you don't, I'm sure he sort of put on his cowboy hat and his boots and he strode into the room and he wrote this uh, fantastic uh, abstract which I would really love to emulate. Yeah. Blah blah interferometers now being detected, developed, uh, the controversy, yada yada. This res letter resolves the controversy. They do. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of wish he just hadn't bothered to write the paper, right? Just <laughs> limited at the abstract. Um, but uh, what he was pointing out again was was uh, was the fact that the fluctuations in photon number will give you uh, diffusive heating. And uh, in his paper, and also in our uh, re derivations back in our lab uh, when it was relevant. What we found was the following, that I showed you earlier that um, light that is on the cavity resonance versus off the cavity resonance carries a different amount of information on the mechanical system. Light that is right at the cavity uh, resonance per photon carries the most information about the motion of the mechanics. Well, by this principle of back action tells me that light in a cavity which is right on the cavity resonance should also be much noisier. Okay, so this was a bit surprising to us when this uh, came out of our calculations. We're always taught that the noise on a coherent state of light is the square root of the number of photons and so on and so forth. So now we're considering inside of a resonator, I have the same intensity of light, the same number of average number of photons, the same square root of that number of photons. And yet this coherent state of light inside of the cavity is extremely quiet if it happens to be in a cavity which is off resonance. Why is that? You know, if I place a detector outside the cavity and I look at the noise on that coherent state, I just see the regular white shot noise that I expect to see. Okay. One interpretation of what's going on, I mean, it turns out it's correct, and one interpretation of what's going on is that when you're looking uh, in free space and you're looking at shot noise, you're looking at a beat note between two things that occur at different frequencies. One of them is the coherent state of light, which is at its resonance, at its frequency. And the other is the electromagnetic noise, the vacuum noise, that's some neighboring frequency. And when you, on your spectrum analyzer in your lab, you see shot noise at a megahertz, let's say, it's due to the beating between a coherent state and the vacuum noise that's a megahertz away. Well, in a cavity, the, uh, the vacuum noise is strongly colored. It's very strong at the cavity resonance, and it's suppressed away from the cavity resonance. And so that explains why uh, temporal fluctuations of the light field are suppressed at low frequency. So we figured we'd go ahead and measure this effect by placing what in, the, in effect is the, a non-destructive photon detector, placing it inside of a cavity and measuring the uh, fluctuations of the photon number. And we found indeed that the photon number fluctuations were largest at the cavity resonance and away from the cavity resonance they were weaker. In terms of optomechanics, we've added this last piece. We now recognize that there's also uh, optical inputs to my cavity optomechanical system. In this case, it might be uh, electromagnetic noise that's coming in on the front mirrors. And those things, according to uh, their frequency with respect to the cavity resonance, they also add some field into the cavity. And so then this uh, completes this, uh, this uh, loop of interactions.
Now, uh, when, when my uh, group at Berkeley looks at this, we of course uh, see feedback loops. We see uh, uh, electronic circuits with uh, closed feedback. And so we're tempted to uh, calculate the closed uh, response feedback, uh, the closed response function. And let me uh, go ahead and do that. We'll replace this whole mess with just something that relates the inputs to the outputs linearly. And we'll focus on conditions where I just want to think about how the optical inputs relate to the optical outputs. And so cavity optomechanics in that case will reduce to a simple matrix, this matrix H, that tells me how amplitude and phase modulations of an input field translate into those of the output cavity field. If you go look inside of this uh, matrix, which tells me about the optical gain of my system, uh, you find that there are many frequencies where the elements in that matrix are larger than one. So cavity optomechanics now gives me a, uh, an amplifier, an optical parametric amplifier uh, for light. And there are other parts uh, in frequency space where the uh, elements are smaller than one, which means that input fluctuations actually become suppressed by the time they uh, exit the cavity. The cavity is sort of some kind of noise eater that uh, eats up the input noise. And if you reduce the input noise sufficiently, the suggestion is that what comes out of the cavity should now be squeezed light. That optomechanics will respond to the quantum fluctuations of the light field and uh, reduce the quantum fluctuations below the standard quantum limits. So we figured we'd go ahead and uh, measure that. So now we're trying to measure uh, squeezing. So we need uh, a detector that is sensitive to the difference between amplitude and phase modulations. So that in our case is a heterodyne detector. It's a rather inefficient one when you can think about how many photons I can detect coming out of this cavity. So the squeezing signal is expected to be very weak. Uh, to get things going, we'll measure the classical ponder mode of gain or the optomechanical gain of our system by putting on a strong AM tone and just seeing how it translates into both uh, amplitude and phase modulations or frequency modulations coming out of the cavity. So this relation between input and output, if you will, is a complex number. I can have a gain and I can also have a phase shift. So here I'm plotting for you both the gain in dB and the phase shift uh, in how AM inputs are translated into either AM or FM outputs from the cavity. So we'll focus on the gain uh, part. Uh, you see that uh, amplitude modulations in the input translate into large phase modulations at the output. That is, the mechanical system, by responding to those AM fluctuations, transduces them into phase modulations. And uh, the transduction can be quite large. I have something like 20 dB of gain in an optical system that's pumped with just about 30 picowatts of power. That just says that I have atoms that are very responsive uh, to light inside of the cavity. Now let's look at the uh, AM portion of, this, of the response. So you see there are some frequencies here below the mechanical resonance frequency, at low frequencies, where the mechanical element responds in phase to the amplitude modulations of light. And that in phase response is such that it accentuates those amplitude modulations. If I drive a mechanical system above its resonance frequency, it responds to that drive out of phase. So I expect then on the other side of frequency space, uh, that the amplitude modulation should be suppressed, and indeed they are by a large amount. And it's in this region of frequency that I expect to see squeezing when I turn off my strong AM drive and I just let the system be driven by shocks. So there we go, we give it a try, and there's our optical squeezing. Everybody's squinting. Should be squinting. Okay, good. So here's, here's this big phase quadrature signal. So remember, that was like the big thing on that plot. This is vacuum noise that is now amplified into very large phase modulations by its interactions with the mechanical element. Okay, we know quantitatively that this is really how the system should respond to just vacuum noise, so we were pleased with that. So given this large response, we expected squeezing in the amplitude quadrature in these uh, gray regions, except for this little noise spike that we couldn't get rid of. Okay, so the squeezing we expect is not great, so we zoom in tremendously. And then we see, uh, indeed, that the AM fluctuations are reduced by about 1% uh, below, below, the back, below, below, shock, below the standard quantum limit. So the light detected on our detector is indeed squeezed below the standard uh, uh, fluctuations of the of electromagnetic vacuum. Um, we would have expected, given the very limited uh, quantum efficiency of our system, to see a little bit more squeezing. Um, but we don't see that much squeezing, and we have guesses for why that is. That has to do with uh, nonlinearities of the system, but those are just guesses. 
but in any case, we were fairly confident that this is uh, below uh, the vacuum level. So okay. So you're going to tell us what the little peak is, the cycle? <coughs> Uh, peaks, right? The so much, no, the 200 kilohertz. Yeah, the, other, the, side band. Uh, the 200 kilohertz thing. That's I don't know something running through the lab at 200 kilohertz. These things happen. It's noise on the propane that we couldn't get rid of, and it's optomechanically amplified. Yeah, which is why it's very large in FM and yeah, but, is, is it, but do you, you don't know what its origin is? Uh, no. And then we weren't able the to get rid of labs. They all have tenure. But, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't turn them off. No, I'm sure it's us. But uh, the fact that we saw it, uh, you know, so clearly in the uh, phase response uh, and could also see it without atoms in the cavity, we sort of knew that that was technical. And, and the one down there about 75 hertz is the same kind of crap. Uh, yes, right. So these are, uh, you're a theorist, right? Yeah, okay, so these are, <laughs> yeah, there's inevitably there's, there's junk, so that's the prominent junk. There's a few humps here that are not junk, uh, that they seem to be part of the system. So there's this pump here in the phase quadrature response, which uh, we had trouble understanding what it is. What I believe that is, it's the uh, disturbance from all these other collective modes of the gas, which are still ringing at the frequency absent the optical spring, which is right at that frequency. So those are enough to disturb uh, the amplitude fluctuations and give us you know, somewhat larger uh, amplitude fluctuations. So we figured we had a good reason to exclude that frequency region from consideration. And then we have this hump up here, which is also not predicted by the theory. And what we think this is due to is the fact that we have a rather strong uh, interaction between the, um, between the me mechanics and the light field. And what is happening is that it's, it's strong enough that it's mixing um, uh, low frequency uh, technical noise with this large uh, resonant response up to these, uh, to these frequencies. So the sort of extra nonlinear terms that have to do with the fact that we have, if you will, too strong a cooperativity in the system. And I think that's, so that, that, sorry, th this peak up here is due to the doubling of this peak, I believe. And then our guess is that the reason why we had extra noise in this region is because we were mixing in low frequency technical noise into that region. But that, that much is guesswork. We don't quite know. Uh, and actually, another ponderative squeezing experiment was just reported. And they also see uh, something that's far uh, from what they'd expected theoretically. And I think they have a similar explanation, but they use fancier words. Now, there's also a bump in the AM at the same place as the bump in the PM. Yes. So is that from the same? That, that's, that's what we suspect. And it's not from the fact, I mean, you should expect harmonics, because we're wiggling uh, a, a cavity back and forth in frequency, and the line is not exactly linear. Uh, but I think this is actually, uh, I don't think that that's the effect. I think it's the, the fact that the atoms sense you know, the, uh, the intensity of light in the cavity, not. So it's, it's sort of a three-way mixing. Okay, so let me go on. So okay, so that's the level to which we've seen quantum aspects of the light coming out of our cavity. How about quantum aspects of the mechanics? Um, there have been a number of reports recently which are really phenomenal that show that cavity cooling, like I described to you, can be used to bring mechanical objects down into their ground state. One mode of a mechanical object, but nevertheless we can bring it down into its ground state, which is really remarkable. You think about that these, these objects over here were things that once carried you know, the fingerprints of the experimentalists, and then it was finally placed in a vacuum chamber, and uh, lo and behold, it's brought down to its ground state. It's really uh, remarkable. Now, um, how is it that you know that an object is truly in or near its ground state? Uh, you can make carefully calibrated measurements, if you will, and that's what a lot of the experiments here did. Or you can turn to you know, the smoking gun, which is to look at light scattered off of an object. And uh, so the people here that work with their uh, ions and ion traps know this quite well, is that uh, light scattered off of an object can sometimes be shifted up or down in frequency uh, if it either leaves behind or takes up a little bit of the energy of the system with which it interacts. And the characteristic of the ground state is that it cannot, it cannot emit more energy. And that means that when you look at these, uh, these sidebands, the Stokes and anti-Stokes sidebands, you should see an increasing asymmetry as the mechanical system spends more and more of its time down near the ground state. So seeing these uh, asymmetric sidebands certainly tells you that you're looking at a quantum mechanical system and also tells you that it's really quite cold. Now, when you do experiments with the ion traps, 
you're doing an experiment typically in the free space electromagnetic environment. Okay, so you expect the uh, up conversion of photons and the down conversion of photons to be related in strength in a certain way. And what you're assuming is that the blue sideband uh, that is generated is from the beat node between your, it's from shot noise, it's from the beat node between your carrier and the electromagnetic noise at frequencies above the carrier frequency. And that the red sideband is generated from this other segment of, uh, of the noise spectrum. So there's a subtlety. If I look at the uh, spectrum of force fluctuations that is driving my mechanical element, again, I have to keep in mind the fact that my atoms sit inside of a cavity and they see colored electromagnetic noise. If I, if I place them at this uh, portion, let's say I'm, I'm detuning uh, to the blue with respect to the cavity resonance, I see that uh, there's a little bit more noise that's trying to drive the red sideband transition than the blue sideband transition. So there's a little more tendency for the system to be driven up the ladder of harmonic oscillator states, which is the source of the mechanical amplification that I told you earlier. Um, similarly, down here on the uh, other side of the cavity resonance, the cavity presents more noise fluctuations that will try to take energy out of the mechanical system, and that's what's responsible for damping. If you will, you can characterize these uh, slopes of the noise spectrum with the temperature, and it won't surprise you that this is a positive temperature to which you cool, this is a negative temperature, which means that you're heating. Over here you have noise that's, if you will, an infinite temperature, and that's where we're uh, making the closest comparison to how you uh, interpret sidebands in ion trap experiments. So uh, these are the data. At the lowest probe levels, we see very strong asymmetries, which show us that the mechanical system that's in our cavity is very cold. We knew that, of course, because we can just let the atoms out of their trap and measure their temperature, and indeed they should have half a phonon of uh, vibration, and they do. If we probe them more strongly, we see that the atoms are heated by the fact that we're probing them, and the asymmetry uh, gradually goes away. Now, one thing that's nice about the cavity system is that uh, you know, it's, it's nearly closed in that the input and output is sort of the, the only way in which your atoms are interacting with the world. And that allows us to interpret the sideband spectrum that we see, let's say, in transmission from our cavity in the following sense. Uh, every time I see, let's say, a blue detuned photon coming out of my cavity, I know that some amount of energy has been extracted from my mechanical oscillator to promote the photon up by that energy. And similarly, I interpret the red side down. So what I have is a system where, by measuring asymmetries of a, a, between Stokes and anti-Stokes lines, I measure temperature. And by measuring absolute and, uh, differences in the heights of these peaks, I measure the heat flux into my system. So I have, packaged together, I have a complete calorimeter, which measures both heat flux and the temperature response uh, to that heat flux. So here's uh, interpreting the, spectra, the, tr the spectrum of transmitted light that we see coming out of our cavity in terms of what is, let's say, the net heat flow into the mechanical system. We find that the net heat flow increases over a large range, uh, just, again, as you would expect given uh, the, the idea of measurement back action. All right, so let me conclude with a few minutes on uh, where I think we're going next. Um, I pointed out that we have atoms in a few neighboring wells of the lattice. Um, when do I have to consider the motion of each of those sub-ensembles of atoms separately, or when can I just lump them all together? All I've told you so far has been under, uh, experiments done in, under conditions where the uh, resonance frequencies for this uh, atomic gas, uh, the resonant frequencies are the same regardless of the well in which we've trapped the atoms. So if you will, I do have several membranes or several mechanical elements inside the resonator, but because they're all oscillating in unison, um, the mode that I'm measuring, the thing that I'm observing through the cavity, is still pretty close to a single normal mode of the system, and it just resonates at this one mechanical frequency. In contrast, if I make it so that the different wells of the optical lattice each resonate mechanically at very different frequencies, then the collective variable that I sense now corresponds uh, to several different modes. I'm sensitive to several different normal modes of the system simultaneously. And now I have to think about the system as being uh, a set of several mechanical elements. Uh, we've been realizing this experimentally uh, as follows. So now we take our atoms and we trap them in an optical lattice that's formed not by light just at one frequency, but at two frequencies. 
uh, both of which, again, are resonant with the cavity field. The overall potential that the atoms uh, see is the sum of these two optical potentials, and that's plotted here in white. And uh, over here on the right, I show you what the mechanical resonance frequency is uh, versus position inside of this cavity. So there's some places within the cavity where the uh, two potentials uh, act in unison to give a stronger confinement. There are other places within the cavity where they attempt to cancel each other out, and the mechanical uh, frequency is suppressed there, and I have a gradient of mechanical frequencies in between. So now if I take my atoms and I trap them at a location such as here, then when the atoms span several neighboring wells, they're, they're now resolved into several uh, distinguishable mechanical elements. Uh, there's an added wrinkle that my probe field has yet another wavelength. And so aside from the variation in the mechanical frequency, I expect also a variation in the uh, linear response or in the sensitivity I have uh, to measurement. Uh, and these data show that kind of dependence. So here, as a function of initial position, where I've placed a small sample of atoms into my cavity, I'm going to plot the frequency spectrum of uh, phase fluctuations on the light that I observe when I probe the cavity on resonance. So when I place them, let's say, right around four microns in the cavity, uh, I take the spectrum and I see a blip over here at this frequency, actually I see two blips, which tells me that there is, in this case, two mechanical, my gas represents two mechanical, or sorry, but my, my gas has two distinct mechanical resonances. And as I place my atoms in different portions of the super lattice, I see that indeed, first of all, the mechanical frequencies vary with position, and the sensitivity to those mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, oscillations also varies sinusoidally. Now to create a, a visible array of several mechanical elements, I'll choose this location, where neighboring lattice sites of the optical super lattice have very distinct mechanical frequencies. Uh, and that's shown here. So as I increase the initial girth of my atomic gas, I can fill one, two, all the way up to about eight neighboring wells of the lattice. And in the transmitted uh, light field, I can collect the mechanical spectrum of, of all of these uh, mechanical resonators. And so here, for example, is a gas where there's uh, six, I think, uh, visible uh, mechanical oscillators, each of which shows a pretty strong asymmetry between the Stokes and anti-Stokes sidebands. So each of these are now down in the quantum regime. Uh, what's this good for? Um, so, so, so can you quickly tell us what the dash and blue lines, red and blue lines are? Yes, I'm sorry. So the blue is the, uh, the uh, anti-Stokes side of resonance. So we have a heterodyne detector. We can uh, tease out the phase modulation, and we can separate out the positive and negative frequency parts of it. So the fact that, uh, so they both peak at the same value, and the red one being much larger means that, let's say, this one has, on average, one phonon or whatever. Um, so what's this uh, useful for? So again, uh, one thing we've been looking at recently is, um, uh, is whether it's possible to, to drive one mechanical oscillator and leave the other one unperturbed, and uh, ultimately whether it's possible to deposit information in one oscillator and either read it out later or maybe transfer it to a different mechanical oscillator at will. So those are the games we're playing presently. Again, we're working these locations within the super lattice where uh, it turns out that the force that's applied by each of these uh, optical lattices is uh, opposite because the atoms are at rest or they're at the equilibrium positions, but, uh, but, but they're not equal to zero. So that means that by uh, modulating the power in one of the beams, I actually get to move my mechanical oscillators up and down. Uh, so here we've done experiments where we take uh, two mechanical oscillators, we create conditions where we have atoms split into two wells, and we play this game where we modulate the forces applied on to the atoms either at the resonance frequency of one or the other of the oscillators to see if we can induce uh, coherent motion on just one of the oscillators without perturbing the other. And that turns out to be the case. We can measure, for example, the sideband asymmetry on the undriven oscillator and see that it's essentially unperturbed by uh, putting a lot of, uh, of energy on, on its neighbor. Okay. So, sort of from the quantum information-ish, although this is entire classical at this stage, but from the sort of information storage, thinking about these mechanical objects as registers, this is telling us something about how well we can address uh, each one of them.
Next, how about coupling them? So I expect the cavity to mediate interactions between the mechanical elements for this obvious reason. So I've told you about the optical spring effect. Now consider I have uh, two elements inside the same cavity. They both feel a force due to the light field in the cavity. And if one of the elements moves, it changes the amount of light in the cavity, which then exerts a different force on the second object. So it's as if there's a spring between these two mechanical objects by the fact that they're exchanging uh, or interacting with the same cavity photons. Uh, what that means is that as I shift my cavity probe, let's say, to the blue or the red of the optical resonance, I should see the presence of extra springs that have suddenly appeared inside of my mechanical system. And those springs should do things like shift resonance frequencies and change the normal modes from being coupled to uncoupled and such. And without going through details, because we haven't really quantified it well, that's, that's what these data are showing. We're seeing both uh, blue shifts to the, to the cavity, to the mechanical frequencies on one side of resonance and red shifts on the other side of resonance, and also a change in the weight of these uh, resonances, which tells us about the coupling of the normal modes due to these springs. Another direction we're pursuing is, uh, is uh, going away from mechanical systems and considering, I guess by analog, uh, also the dynamics of spin systems inside of the cavity. So, uh, first of all, I'll demonstrate that our cavity is very sensitive not just to mechanical motion, but also to the spin of the atoms. This has to do with the fact that the gas in the, in the cavity is birefringent. It interacts more strongly with circular polarized light of one helicity than the other. And so, for example, if I probe my cavity uh, on, on its resonance, say, with my atoms pointed in a, uh, with their spin along the cavity axis, I might see the cavity resonance frequency shifted by a certain amount. Let's say it's now shifted by uh, around 25 megahertz away from resonance. Now if I apply a radio frequency field that will flip the uh, spin of my atoms, uh, I can see quite clearly that the cavity frequency jumps as a response to that spin flip, which again exhibits that we have a strong spin sensitivity as well as a mechanical sensitivity to what's going on in the cavity. And that means that everything I told you so far about cavity optomechanics, everything, the measurements, the back action, the squeezing, the sidebands, all of it, um, all translates also directly into uh, the interactions of spin ensembles with the cavity. For the following reason, you can imagine that a, a mechanical system, as it evolves, it processes in a simple harmonic system, processes in phase space, in a two-dimensional phase space. Okay, similarly, if I have a field pointing over there and I take a magnetic moment and tip it off axis, it processes. And that two-dimensional precession has complete analogy, well, at least for a small precession, has an analogy to the motion of a, of a harmonic oscillator. So by choosing the geometry right, uh, I expect to see all of this occur. I expect uh, optical spring effects to show up as longer frequency shifts. I expect ponder-motive squeezing to be a sort of magneto-optical squeezing. Uh, I expect the cavity-mediated forces between mechanical elements that we're starting to see in our data to also tell me that I have uh, cavity-induced interactions between spins in a cavity as well. So this is the potential for these uh, experiments as I see it over the next few years. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, replace what's in our system with something much richer. And in atomic physics, we've been dealing with fairly rich uh, quantum systems which can be, let's say, arrays of spins or arrays of mechanical elements or both. And uh, by placing it inside of a high, by placing the system inside of a high finesse cavity, I gain several capabilities. Uh, one is, as I've shown you, by looking at the output, I can make very sensitive measurements to what's going on inside. I can measure with very high sensitivity. I can measure with very high spatial resolution, for example, by doing magnetic resonance imaging or mechanical resonance imaging. I can see the, the response of each of these objects inside of the cavity individually as it interacts with the cavity field. Similarly, I can imagine using a cavity that uh, is a, a very good detector for just a part of the system and uh, doesn't know anything about the remainder of the system. For example, I was able to observe one collective mode of a system but not observe the others. So if you wanted to observe a small subsystem of a large uh, many-body system, this could be your way of doing so. Uh, secondly, the cavity has given me the ability to induce interactions between objects. And that seems like it satisfies uh, one of the long-standing desires, that, well, so anyhow, roughly decade-old desire in, in atomic physics, 
which is to get to the point where we're simulating the very difficult problems of condensed matter physics. And one of the difficulties in that simulation, which the ion trappers don't suffer from as much, uh, is how to get interactions between objects that are trapped in distant lattice sites. So we would love to do studies of quantum magnetism with atoms trapped in an optical lattice, but darn it, once I trap the atoms in the optical lattice, I can hardly get them to interact with each other at a distance, much less so in a spin-dependent manner. Maybe here's a way out of that problem. We can use the exchange of cavity photons to have really strong interactions between objects even at large distances, large physical distances, so long as they sit within the same cavity mode. And I would say this uh, initial glimpse of springs between elements in a mechanical array was pointing us in that direction. Last, one of the features that's phenomenal about the cavity system is that it realizes measurements at the quantum measurement limits. And if you think about how to perform the measurements, you can reach measurement sensitivity at the standard quantum limits, whatever those are, and you can sometimes go to non-standard quantum limits and ultimately reach measurements that are, I'd say, at least in terms of optics, the least perturbative you can make them because you've restricted the interaction between atoms and light just to the uh, interactions which are necessary for your measurement. So it would be possible in a cavity to make a system which has uh, very high, you have very high sensitivity measurement, you have interactions, but you also have the ability to make measurements that are non-perturbative enough that it's meaningful to use them to apply feedback to your many-body quantum system. And um, you know, m many of us are, are uh, paying a lot of attention to, to new possibilities in non-equilibrium physics that can be reached in, in atomic systems. A lot of those uh, ideas in non-equilibrium physics have been of the type where I have a static Hamiltonian, I have an initial state that's not an equilibrium state, and I press go, and then later on I see what's going on. But you imagine a very different non-equilibrium dynamics can occur in a closed feedback loop. You can have systems which find their ways to different stability points. You can imagine uh, steady state phenomena that look like phase transitions, um, and, and the system generally can be uh, richer. So that would be more broadly where I think this kind of research will go in the next years. Okay. So uh, these are a bunch of the people that have been working on the cavity experiment. I apologize, the picture is kind of old. Sydney's the only one left of all these uh, folks, uh, but she's joined with a recent postdoc. They're making great measurements of quantum-limited force sensitivity and uh, are almost finished calibrating their data. Um, I apologize, there's a lot that's going on in my group that I didn't talk about, but I apparently have several opportunities to discuss those still. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>